Bienvenidos. Welcome to Latino Focus, the show that honors the presence of the Latino community here in San Jose. Today in our studio, Julissa Ramirez will talk about the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers in Silicon Valley. And later, Freddy Pereira from Isabela's Restaurant will bring us delicious flavors from Peru. We'll close our program with two great Latino artists, Roberto Romo and Elba Raquel Romo. But for now, let's open our show with a great bachata dance performed by Hector Reyes and Liz Hernandez Bautista from Studio Mambo Nova. Adelante. We got this one, baby, la guitarra. Si te he vivido todo fuera de lo natural, es fuerte el amor, pero se acaba. Everything for you was once my plan. You were my baby, and I was your man. But we kept the silence, the cool inside. And now it speaks through our eyes. Thank you, Hector and Liz from Mambo Nova. And now to open our series of shows with us is Julissa Ramirez from the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Julissa, thank you very much for being on our show today. Thank you for having me. So let, tell us a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you go to school? What did you study? And what type of work did you do? Sure. Um, my name is Julissa Ramirez, like you said. I am from the Dominican Republic. I grew up in New York City and went to school in upstate New York. Um, I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology where I got my bachelor's in electrical mechanical engineering and I got my master's in manufacturing mechanical systems uh, with a minor in management. <laughs> Great. Uh, and then from there on I came to the Silicon Valley to, so I work now for Intel as an industrial engineer. As an industrial engineer. Mm -hmm. So what do you do as an industrial engineer? So industrial engineers are in charge of process improvement and um, so we own processes and we, we can do anything as um, studies in cost or people or it just depends what your department. A lot of work. Does. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever imagine be, uh, going into engineer growing up as a, as a kid? I actually wanted to be an artist when I was growing up in Manhattan. Um, I went to school in Manhattan. So when I was growing up and I, there was a engineer that approached me and after that I just knew I wanted to be an engineer. Great. So tell us about your organization. Uh, so we are with the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, uh, Silicon Valley Professional Chapter. It's a national organization that is the, actually the largest tech Latino organization in the country. Um, we do a lot of work with, um, you know, community service, uh, professional development, um, STEM outreach, things like that of that nature. And um, we focus on trying to build a community for all the Latinos engineers in the area. What is STEM? STEM is science, technology, math, and, oh my God, engineering. <laughs> engineering. Great. So. Um, what is it, some of the programs and services that you do out uh, in the community? Sure. Uh, a big, one of our big programs, our national initiatives, is called Noche de Ciencias, Night of Science. And um, what we do is we go out to maybe a middle school or an elementary school in the area. Uh, this past spring, we went to Sherman Oaks Elementary School. 
and we uh, provide different kinds of activities for the children to play with and we expose them to STEM and the sciences through that. Um, and it can reach up to 200 students at a time. Uh, we also educate their parents by having a parent-teacher workshop. Um, and that way the parents and the students uh, can both learn about engineering and the opportunities in the area. What um, percentage of Latinos or Hispanics uh, have uh, engineering degrees? Sure, um, so I would say it's anywhere between two to five percent. Uh, the numbers are increasing. However, if I don't know if you're aware of um, the Googles and the Yahoos that are releasing their information about how many Latinos are part of their workforce, and we're seeing that about 2% of Latinos are compri comprising their workforce and even less women. So because of that, I feel like organizations like SHEP um, are so important so that we can unite and get these people, these bright Latinos and Hispanics into those organizations. Into those, but it's a critical to begin um, working with kids uh, right. at elementary level to teach them about uh, engineering and maths and science. And that's right. So that's why we have the Noche de Ciencias where it's K through, through 12. Um, we want to reach them early early enough so that once they're growing up, they know about these opportunities. They know that you can be an engineer. I've been to a number of different conferences where children don't even know that that's a possibility. They've never seen it in their families. Um, in fact, I was the first of my family to you know, ever graduate with an engineering degree. I'm the only one to have a master's, and I was the first one to have my bachelor's degree. So just in that, um, in my family, I was lucky enough to understand and, and be exposed to some opportunities, but our kids don't have that. If they don't have someone going out into the community telling them, you can be this, you can be that, then who's gonna do it? What is uh, your organization uh, doing to reach out to more uh, women, Latina women, uh, Hispanic women, to consider uh, going into the field of engineering and the sciences? Sure, so we have a, we partner up with an organization called Listas, which I'm one of the founders as well, is Latinas in STEM to Achieve Success. And um, we have a middle school girls conference where we had 250 girls in Redwood City. Um, attend and there we expose them to different um, activities. Uh, we have professionals speaking to them, um, different professionals in the field of sciences and uh, that's, that's kind of our way to, to reach the young girls. We're also partnering up with um, Girl Scouts and I'm hoping to reach out to the Latino Girl Scouts that are there um, early enough. So those are some of the initiatives that we're working on. Sounds like you are doing great work in uh, trying to uh, break that barrier uh, and, and attract more Latinos and Latinas into the engineering field, which is very critical yes. um, uh, uh, part of our economy and where the jobs are being created at this point. Mm -hmm. um, what program, uh, events or activities uh, does your organization put uh, uh, together for people to uh, come by and network and uh, learn more information? Sure, um, last week we had a uh, design shop workshop at Google. So mind you, all these activities we do through Eventbrite, so anyone can come, anyone can participate. Um, we also have a Bomba Blast where we're teaching our um, student chapters and our student leaders uh, how to prepare a resume for an interview or things like that. Uh, we also have our national conference that's happening in Detroit, anyone can attend. Um, and that's in November. We have our uh, Fall Noche de Ciencias, which we're trying to do at the Tech Museum this year. It's free for all families, for everyone in the community, so we're, we're gonna try to get the word out there. Um, and other networking opportunities like Tech Talks, et cetera. Great. Uh, any other information uh, that you'd like to share with our viewers uh, that they could benefit from? Sure, I would say that if you have any questions, any any, um, you need any information, just go to our website, it's sheb-sv.org, and there you'll find everything you need to know. Great, well, thank you very much for being on our show and sharing not only your story mm -hmm. uh, and how you became a professional engineer, um, and not only just obtain a, a bachelor's degree, but a master's, but also the great valuable information that your organization uh, provides to the community. Um, so hopefully our community will uh, take that information and so. start calling and, uh, and emailing your organization uh, to inquire about opportunities uh, and how to uh, get more information. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. 
And later on in the show, Freddy Pereira comes to us with flavors from Peru. But before, let's learn how the Latino community should manage its money with financial expert Marcos Lira. I'm Marcos Lira, a certified financial planner. And today I'm excited to be talking about budgeting, part one, understanding your cash flow. In a recent survey by Bankrate.com, they uncovered that about 76% of Americans are living from paycheck to paycheck. Not knowing when your money arrives or when and where it leaves is the main reason we live this way. Here are four steps you need to take to change the situation. Number one, you wanna gather your credit card statements, bank account statements, and any other statement that shows your spending for the last three to six months. Number two, you wanna analyze these statements line by line and categorize common expenses. For example, like coffee shops, groceries, fast food, and your rent. Number three, you wanna begin tracking all your daily spending on a notebook for a minimum of four weeks. And lastly, you wanna write down the average spending amount for each category. Next time, we'll talk about how to use this information to create a spending plan. If you'd like to continue this conversation or have any questions, please reach out to me on Twitter at MHLira. And remember, invest in today to enjoy your dividends tomorrow. I'm here with Freddy Pereira to take a bite out of the tasty flavors of Peru. But before we dig in, let's learn a little bit about Peru itself. Peru is a coastal country located in Western South America. Its geography varies from arid plains to mountain peaks to tropical forests. The Republic of Peru was created in 1821. But before then, it was the home of many ancient cultures from the Norte Chico civilization to the Inca Empire. Because of this historical wealth, Peruvians enjoy a colorful and expansive culture. Our national animal is the vicuna, which is a relative of the llama. Peru also has the fastest growing economy as of 2011, and mainly exports copper, gold, zinc, textiles, and fish meal. Lima, the fifth largest city in the Americas, is the capital of Peru. If you decide to visit Peru, I recommend that you stop a moment and soak in the beautiful country and culture of Peru. And take a trip to Machu Picchu, one of the new seven wonders of the world. Goodbye. Freddie, before we get started, uh, can you share with us uh, what part of Peru you're from and your family? And uh, it'd be great. Yeah, we, uh, we are from the north part of Peru. Yeah, I born in Trujillo. Trujillo is a city on the coast. So our food is particularly from the coast area, you know, the mountains, okay? And uh, we learn cooking because uh, 24 million of 25 million of Peruvians, everybody cooks at home. So I got some examples of the food that we do at home. So, so the recipes that you have at your restaurant, uh, you learned that growing up at home, yes. watching your uh, my your, mother, your you mother, know, and cook? the restaurant is the name of her, Isabella's. Okay, you named the restaurant after your mom. Yes, great. Yes. So, um, how did uh, how was Isabella's born? Um, the concept. Uh, Isabella's born because I my family uh, my mother teach my cousins how to cook, and they went to Miami and they developing two or three restaurants over there. So when they come to see me in the West Coast, uh, San Jose area, uh -huh. so they told me why I don't do a restaurant. So I went back to Miami, they showed me how is uh, uh, the part of buying, you know, administration and all that stuff. How to run and a business. The menus and all that stuff. So I come back here and then we, we decide to open in San Jose, Isabella's restaurant. Isabella's, wow, mm -hmm. so you went back to Miami, learned how to cook, yeah, learned I, how to mm -hmm. run a business, right. came back and opened your restaurant. Oh, yes. So, okay, what did we have here? What's the first dish we have? Okay, we got uh, two traditional Peruvian dishes. Uh, one is the version of the fish ceviche. Uh, it's mixed, uh, has mussels, fish, scallops, uh, calamari, and it's around with sweet potato, and has soft corn, and also hard corn, like it's called cancha, uh -huh. canchita. And uh, it's very popular. They say it is a, it's like a Peruvian sushi. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's cooked with lime. So I understand it's a very spicy uh, ceviche. It could be uh, ceviche, no spicy, it's no ceviche. 
Yeah, it has All to right. be a spicy, and uh, some people don't like it. It's for that you have a, a shelters area, soft corn, hard corn, and sweet potato. And that's to help with the spiciness. When, yes, when you get hot, the spice. Okay, go to the sweet potato. You uh, take a Tone bite out of the sweet potato, <laughs> tone it down. Great. <laughs> what do we have here? The second dish. Arrojo mariscos. Uh, background is a Spanish background. is a, is a family of the fa famous paella, the Spanish paella. So somewhat like a paella. Yeah, it has, but it's only seafood. I think in Spain they do with with. Uh, Different beef, meats. chicken, uh, different meats. And this is only only seafood. Yeah, it's only seafood. So, um, what are some of the, the ingredients that you use? Uh, well, we use the color is azafrán, the same like uh, the arroz con mariscos, and mm -hmm. uh, has uh, the special uh, Peruvian ingredients there: uh, ají panca, uh, uh, milk, and uh, also cream, cream milk, and. It's decorated with the seafood and has mussels, shrimp, scallops, calamari. calamari. Great! This is amazing. It's very famous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which one of these is your favorite dish? Uh, both are uh, favorites of the clients. Uh huh. So I decided to bring it, and usually they share. So when they go to the restaurant, they say, "Oh, we we built up a family." Family plates, family you know? style plates. Yeah, because usually go families there. They go, okay, we want to eat arroz con mariscos or, or ceviche mixto. So we make a family, family dish. So it's a double size or triple size or the, the the single ones. So it could fit maybe six people, or Great. seven people. Where's your restaurant located? It's in 700 South Winchester Boulevard, San Jose, nine five one two eight. And uh, it's uh, very close to Santana Row, two or three blocks. Great. Freddie, yeah. thank you so much for being on our show. We appreciate you taking the time to share a little bit about yourself and uh, the restaurant Isabelas and thank sharing you. with us these dishes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you. I hope most of you at home explore these delicious flavors from Peru. And now let's go out of the studio for our Arts Alive segment with artists Roberto and Elba. I, I grew up here in Eastside San Jose. I was actually, we were born in downtown San Jose. And then my parents' dream was to go back to Mexico. Both of my parents are, were born in Guadalajara. And that was their goal, take the family back home. And we lived there for about a year. And financially, my parents couldn't do it. My dad lived here while he supported us in Mexico. So when I was about five, we came back, and I've been here ever since I was five. The way that it developed was just um, imagining things and then trying to see what I was imagining, to see if it was real, to get him out of my, the realm of the thought and put him on paper. And then when I saw that I had that potential, I was like, wow. Or sometimes I would listen to people express themselves and when they would express themselves, I would say, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, it's like that. Growing up here influenced my art tremendously. You see a lot of the, um, the, the, the very typical cultural Mexican style of uh, Frida Kahlo, or even the murals that are around here, this very Diego Rivera, which I think is where all my passion came from. Right now I teach a class here at the School of Arts and Culture, one is the Frida Kahlo art, and then there's a Diego Rivera art class. So just growing up with Mexican parents in a Mexican neighborhood, being in touch with that definitely influenced. The stuff that I paint about in my own personal work has to do with a lot of the social issues that are going on in the neighborhoods. And it helps me when I teach because I know where the kids are coming from. My career actually began here at the School of Arts and Culture. I'm very thankful for that. I was always very critical of my artwork. I never thought it was good enough, right? I always, I'm a perfectionist and I'm always re, re inventing myself, getting my technique better. And then one day that I felt very comfortable, I came in through the door and says, look at my paintings. I want to work here. Can, do you have work? Well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an illustrator. This is oh great, you know, we have a, a, an opportunity coming up. And uh, ever since that time that I was given the opportunity to be not only an artist, but a teaching artist, 
that switched the mindset. I'm the first one to graduate from uh, college and continue to a university. So I never had the support of my family in that, in that sense. They're great people, but they never um, really focus on education. He's a placard, she's a placard. He's a placard, he's a placard. She's a placard. It just means person. What was the pattern number four? The four. Four directions. Four directions. How do I start the four directions? I went through school for four and a half years, uh, paying full rent, having full time employment, and winning awards. The first time I got to the university, I was already being recognized for my work as a freshman. So all of those years of, of just continuous work reflected, and I'm the first one in my family to, to have that college and university degree, so it's very important. I like to do a lot of stuff that is based on social issues. I also like to infuse uh, nature into my work. So I take from nature, I observe people, I listen to the news, and all of that, and part of my heritage being Mexican, it all kind of blends into this social political work, but it's, it also has some a very emotional, very personal. I graduated actually from the Academy of Art in San Francisco as an illustrator, and they taught me how to tell stories. So one can learn how to create technically, but if you don't know how to tell a story, then your painting is not gonna be able to, it's like a book. Your painting needs to be like an open book. Besides the um, Aztec card pre-Columbian, I also teach uh, paper mache, which is a very classical way of working with um, recycled paper. And what I teach is a little bit of sculpture. What I do is en engrudo, uh, the old recipe. I, I put a little bit of flour, water, and glue, and then we cut the paper, we build skeletons, and then we add, uh, you know, ears and cut out the ears. And it also teaches kids to give something discarded a new life, a new meaning. It's like, look at that cool box. What can we make? You know, we tend to say, oh, it's a box. I put something in it, I gave it to you, and then I throw it away. Give it a second life, paint it, create. The best pleasure that I've had with the students in the arts is letting them know that I got educated. I worked very hard. I'm an immigrant. I was born in a different country. Education was never highlighted in my family. I'm 35 years old. I've lived in about 20 houses in my life. And it used to be that in the past, your instructor was a complete opposite person. They come from a very rich family, a very wealthy, educated, where academics is always like, no, my son's going to college. So now I have that connection. I know how to speak to them. They respond. Their, their little eyes just flicker. They're like, oh, you're one of me. I know, I understand you. So when there's that connection, you, there's, there's a stronger family sense. We come with similar, similar values similar views, but always pushing them to be better. When kids are starting to work on a project, they fight you. I can't do this. Nope. In my class, there's no such thing as I can't. There's no such thing as I give up. It's a process. In the beginning, everything is difficult. And I tell them, it took a long time to do this step by step by step. I will guide you, but you have to trust me. I tell them this is a lot like life. So just because you can't ride a bike, for instance, at the beginning, you have to learn how to just balance. It's not even about pedaling, it's about balance. So in art, we teach you patience, we teach you persistence, we teach you a lot of steps that you can use in life. You teach the child, and the thing that the child does is go brag about what they learned. Oh, mom, did you know that the Aztecs? Did you know that they used to do this? Their houses were like this. Oh, really? So the parent comes back and says, wow, you've taught me something 
through my child. And that's very important. That is community. Thank you to our audience for supporting Latino Focus. That's all for our show today. And remember that in each community, there's beauty and strength. Gracias y hasta pronto.